Um, we need your feedback in two ways. Uh, Fizun has a comprehensive evaluation form, and 40 Plus has a form as well. Uh, there's a drawing and so forth, um, and we'll explain that a little bit later. A couple of drawings, perhaps. Um, on the table outside, you saw, you'll see our calendar of events for March. Uh, we have some events, one more event remaining in, in February. Uh, this coming Monday, one of our popular speakers is going to be talking about LinkedIn uh, and the new ways to use that. But these are our events for March. Our March evening event, uh, again, thanks to Faizun, a colleague of hers, Frank Felker, is going to be describing what he calls the boomerpreneur's dilemma. So for those of us in the baby boomer generation, or close to it, um, as we approach retirement or at certain points, you know, is, is what's next? You know, uh, retirement may not be the only option. Uh, owning your own business might be one. A couple of quick statistics related to that, and I think it connects directly with what we're gonna be talking about tonight. For those who are 55 and over, 16 million folks who are 55 and over are, are in the freelance or gig economy. Whether it's working in organiz with organizations like Upwork or the Freelancers Union, this is a whole new world. Uh, a book you might want to look at that addresses this and, and other kinds of transitional uh, factors for this generation and for other generations as well, Career 180, like 180 degree turn. Uh, Mike Harris is the author, relatively new book, but I just was, I was blown away by that. 16 million folks, 55 and over, are into the freelance world. Why? Because there may not be the same type of opportunities that there were for, for them earlier in their career. So, okay, that's what's coming up at 40 plus, and some ideas. I'm gonna quickly introduce our speakers because that's who you're here. So Faizun Kamala, she mentioned, is a franchise specialist and coach, and a good friend of 40 plus. Uh, she conducts these types of workshops with would-be entrepreneurs to make the transition from employee to business owner. She has extensive knowledge of the franchise industry and provides individual guidance to people interested in investigating active or passive entrepreneurship through a proven business model. Formerly with a Fortune, formerly a Fortune 15 executive, Faisun has over 18 years of experience in corporate, multinational, nonprofit, and entrepreneurial settings across three continents. She's an expert in public policy development, corporate responsibility, social enterprise, and crisis communications. Skilled in contextual intelligence, she's created new business opportunities by lever leveraging strategic alliance, alliances. Her uh, undergraduate work is in women's studies and environmental studies from Mount Holyoke, a master's degree in public policy from Johns Hopkins. And a colleague, Brian Selber, is an assistant vice president at City National Bank here in Washington. She, he is uh, as I said, based in Washington, his role is to partner with entrepreneurs and their families as their full-service banking advisor. Prior to joining City National, Mr. Selber worked at M&T Bank, gaining experience in retail bank banking branch management, small business development, and the bank's management development program. He's mentored new trainees at the bank and was active in the company's collegiate recruiting efforts throughout the Mid-Atlantic. His bachelor's is from Washington Lee, Washington and Lee University, and has done other extensive work at the Montgomery Leadership Program, and has also volunteered at the, Mon at the Maryland Women's Business Center. Please join me in welcoming Faisun and Brian. Thank you. All right, you're up. What'd you pour? Hi, everyone. Oh, gosh. Do you guys need some more wine? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Good to see you. It's lovely to have you here, given what a balmy, beautiful day it's been, and you guys are here, right? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was getting a little chilly when you walked over, and of course we got lost and then we were it over here. Um, we have quite a bit of information for you today. Um, I've included the slides. We may not go too much into the details of each slide. If you guys would like a copy of the deck, I'm happy to send that to you. You don't need to take copious notes. Get another glass of wine, sit back, and relax. As they say when you get on the plane, right? <laughs> All right, so today we're going to talk about if any of you are interested in starting your own business, particularly a franchise, what's the process? What do you do? What do you go through? Once we've figured that part out, Mr. Selber comes in and he starts to talk about how would you find, how would you fund that business that you've selected? All right, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Ken already introduced me. There's no need for me to say anything. Other than, like many people, let me ask the question. How many 
people in the room here has ever gotten laid off? Ah, I have some dear and near friends in this room. So, yeah, once. Once? Yeah, but I got a job. More than freaking enough, yeah. is what I say. Yeah. April 2015, after almost a 10 year career in corporate, I got laid off from Verizon. And it was the best thing after the birth of my daughter. The second best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Truly, truly. Working 80 hour weeks, I had just had my daughter. Life was completely out of whack. Um, and something needed to change. Right? At that point, once I got laid off, instead of jumping right back into it, which many of us have done, I wondered what, what, what would my next steps look like that would be more strategic and more intentional. And somewhere along that path, I found the world of franchise. And now this is what I do. Mr. Brian, tell us your story, sir. That's me. And um, disclaimer, I am here because I believe in this being a very appropriate uh, business path for certain folks. It's certainly not for everybody, but um, in my position in the retail and business bank down the street, um, I get to meet folks in all different walks of life, but I would say generally the most interesting cases are folks that are in transition, either looking to buy a home, looking to start or grow a family, looking at moving from one career to a different one. So this does come up a lot in the day to day. And um, the one thing I wanted to highlight just to start to give you a sense of what it can actually be like to be in the business banking space because unless you are a banker, it's just got its own language and it probably doesn't seem very interesting to folks, but um, it was actually just yesterday at my follow-up meeting, the reason we put dot connector by that, um, what it means, what I do when I'm not sitting in front of a client, I'm looking for the next good client and family to work with. I work at a bank that the door is locked, people don't just come in off the street and find us, I go out and find the people I want to work with, whether they own business or not, because everybody needs a bank every now and then. Um, and I seek out people based on things I read in the newspaper, based on introductions or referrals from friends of mine that are just out in the field that know interesting people. And um, yeah, just yesterday I had what will probably go down as one of the best meetings of the year, a small business that is quickly becoming a very big business. And we were talking about a $5 million commercial loan to basically blow them up to take them to the next level. That would be a very big deal for my team. and. That doesn't just happen by accident. I didn't look into it. I reached out to the owner, two young owners that are a couple years older than me. So you can tell I'm pretty young. And I reached out to them about six months ago and emailed the owner and just said, hey, I like your product. My girlfriend loves it. I think it's OK. Do you guys want to meet? Can I tell you about what it's like at the bank if you don't have somebody like me in your life? And they probably just thought I was so strange. <laughs> they took the meeting. But then since that aha moment, I've had a lot of people in that space, whether they're entrepreneurs by trade or not, where if they value having consultants and accountants and financial advisors in their world, then I usually can fit in there pretty well too and complement these plans. Fantastic. Because I now own my own business, I actually get to work with people that I like. Wonder that, right? That didn't happen too often when I was uh, working with a man. All right, fantastic. Okay. Franchise Consulting Company, that's my company. We do only one thing. We match folks like you with a business that fits your goals. Whatever those goals might be, personal goals, financial goals, lifestyle goals, and each individual client is unique. And so the businesses that we end up showing them that they end up eventually buying is based on those unique needs and goals that they have, right? A lot of people ask me, well, you sell franchises. They don't. I don't have a license to sell franchises. I need that. Instead, what I offer are educational resources. If this is the path you're going to go down on, let's make sure that you have a map of the road ahead. That's what I do. The second question I get from a lot of people, do I pay you to work with you? I don't. I work exactly like an executive headhunter or a realtor. Once a client is placed, in a franchise, the franchise pays the consulting, franchise consulting company. So I say to everyone, use me, but don't abuse me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's our agenda. 
we're going to look at, obviously, business ownership, right? How many of you here right now are working, have a job? How many of you have wondered if there's something else out there? Yeah. We're going to talk, we're going to go deeply into franchising, right? We'll talk about how franchising <coughs> works. Some of this information might be a little old to you. You might know it already, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of a deep dive on what that is, right? We're going to talk about how do you make the determination whether franchising is right for you, like anything else in life. Franchise is not for everyone. Maybe for you, it may not be. Right? We'll talk a little bit about that. How do you find your perfect fit franchise? Does anybody know, just in the United States alone, how many different franchises exist? Throw up numbers. How many do you think there are? John? Three, 500,000. Nah, go down. 200,000. Nah, come down, come down. 50,000. Come down. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I overshot the mark. There are about 3,500. 3,500 3, different franchises. Okay. Which, by the way, if you are sitting here today wondering if you wanted to buy a franchise, 3,500 is still a whole lot of businesses to look at. How would you know which one is the right one for you? We'll talk about that. We'll transition then into how would you work with your franchise coach and somebody who's an expert in finances, because that ain't me. Right? Talk about that. Brian is then going to work, uh, move into how you fund your franchise, and we'll talk about some next steps. Is there anything else you guys would like us to cover? You good? All right. Sit back, relax, enjoy the ride. Okay. How many of you have had this happen to you? Ever. You're in a job interview situation, and the interviewers look at you, they look you up and down, and they say, John, your resume looks great. We're looking for someone aged about 25 with about 35 years of experience. Yeah? I find that. I would hope they wouldn't be that foolish. That's against the law. <laughs> the unfortunate part, John, number two, is. <laughs> They will say this to you, just in other ways. In ways that make, that move, that have you walk out of that room, not feeling so great. That's what they do, okay? Which begs the question, job security. Our parents told us that, all our lives, right? Go to the right schools, da 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 job security. Get the golden watch, all that stuff. Really, what is the security in job security? Is there any security in job security, right? Don't go through all of this. This is from a study that was done recently. People who are in the 40 plus, after organization, people who are in the 40 plus age range, they look for a new job often twice as long as people who are less than 40. It's a fact. Ageism is well and well. <coughs> Make no mistake. Right? Peak incomes. So this is typically in a person's career, man or woman, the most amount of money that they will make. For peak incomes, for men, it used to be 55. It's dropped to 48. For women, it used to be 45. It's not 39. You're making less money faster in your life and in your career. Right? These are the kinds of things people are dealing with when they're looking for a job. This is ownership. Why are you all here? Isn't that just super risky? Okay. Venturing into the big unknown. Why would you want to do that? Go back, get a job. Even if the interviewer doesn't tell you to your face what the cartoon said. Okay. Here are the things that happen with business ownership you will find. At first, it's scary. At first, it is the riskiest, actually. But. Can this ever happen? It's yours, right? Can you ever be laid off, transferred, outsourced? All those lovely words that we like to use, right? No, nope. it's yours. You can grow the business at the pace that you want. If you started a job today, two years down the road, do you think the level of effort you put into your job goes down? You can just coast? Or is it mostly the opposite? It's the opposite. 
right? It's the opposite. And the reality is the longer you have your business, the safer it becomes. My friend Dennis over there, he's a fellow franchisee. He's the owner of a business he's not in. That is indeed true. The longer you have it, the risk goes down, right? So, is business ownership risky? Do we have true job security, or is it exactly the opposite? Okay, think about that for a bit. Let's talk about buying a franchise. And by the way, there are really three different ways in which you can start a business. You can start a business from scratch. I could put up shingles outside that said Faizun's Plumbing, LLC, and I could call it a day. I've started a business from scratch. I could buy Brian's Plumbing, LLC, an existing business from him. That's the second way, and then this is the third way. So I'm not going to go into too great details in the first two, since we are li a little bit limited on time. How much time are we working with? About another half hour? Probably stay at 30. Yeah. 8 30. Okay, cool. How many of you have heard of a franchise being referred to as a business in a box? Anyone? Yeah? Why is it called a business in a box? You don't get to answer. <laughs> I know you raised your hand, you don't get to answer. Why is it called a business in, in a box? Ideas, thoughts, yes, Robert. Well, it's got everything you need to get going. You just open it up and get go. That's right. That is exactly right. Right? You keep being given a box, you open up the box, and you have a playbook. That is what you are paying the money for to get into the franchise. You get the playbook. Right? The playbook contains all of this. The robust franchises out there come with support systems. There's a sales system in place. There's a customer recruitment and retention system in place. There may be a billing system in place, etc. It's a business in a box. Because it's a business in a box, you have a quicker startup, which means you get to what quicker? Profitability. Does anyone know? On average, how many years does it take for a business started from scratch to turn profitable? Three years. Yes, again. Five. Yes, again, Tom. Five. Five. One more guess. To make a profit. To make a profit. So. Ten. Ten. Average. Now, why is that important? You're turning a profit only once you have broken even you have recouped your initial investment, right? After that, every penny you make is pure profit. This guy here, he knows the mechanics far better than I. But that's why we say, when does it become profitable? Yeah. With, a, with a franchise, you almost always, almost certainly will have a quicker startup. Yeah. One of the things that we find, for those of us who've ever had a JOB, if you're going into a new position, I think you're a higher position within the company. You're a new com company entirely different. You are asked to go through training. You may be asked to go back to school, right? You may need to get additional certifications because you don't meet whatever the criteria is. The beauty of a franchise is you never have to go back to school or get another degree. When you found your perfect fit franchise, your franchisor will give you the in-depth training that you need before they let you lose and set you free. That's a huge advantage. It saves you money, it saves you time. We are able to do that because when I sit down with clients, I will ask you, what is your most valuable top three transferable skill set? In just a two minute conversation, Ron, I have a pretty good idea of what it might be. Transferable skill set, management, ops, Customer service, right? These are skills that you can parlay into a whole different type, whole, a whole variety of different business models. That's the beauty of the franchise. <coughs> um, regulated by the FTC. Who knows what the FTC is? Federal Trade Commission. That's right. Franchising, like banking, is a highly regulated industry. Why do you care? You care because this means it's <coughs> federal government oversight. A lot of people get scared by, you know, those businesses, those franchises that are out there, but they're out there to just get your money. You wake up the next morning and they're nowhere to be found. For a franchise to be in legal standing, 
they have to file a very specific legal document with the Trade Commission every single year, even if nothing has materially changed in the past 12 months. That's a huge advantage for clients as far as security and lessening the risk. Right? As with anything else, this is not a silver bullet. There are cons. <coughs> Biggest one. I meet a lot of people in seminars like this who say, well, if I zoom, that's fantastic, but I'm telling you, I am never going to follow anyone's orders, advice, direction ever again. I'm done with that. Then a franchise is not for you. Why are you paying the franchise fee? Why are you paying the ongoing royalty for that playbook, for the system support that you get? And if you're not going to follow it, then a franchise may not be the right option. And if I yes, may, sir. Um, you mentioned that the certifications needed may not, you may not have to go back to school for a certain franchise that is of interest to you. I had coffee yesterday morning with a veteran. He was in the Army for a couple of years, young guy. He now owns a massage therapy franchise. He is not a uh, classically trained in masseuse. And um, <coughs> somebody else I know that is in Virginia that owns a UPS store, he worked for the government. And they're both rock and rolling profitable because I've seen the books. And two examples that I've met with the past couple days where, yeah, when I first heard the story, I've known them both for a little while, but when I first heard their stories and asked the background questions, because I know if I was young, I was like, how did you find this one? How did you choose this massage parlor given your background in the military? And he was just like, I'm a sharp guy, and it seemed like a smart business, and I met some of the other franchisees, and I was impressed. I had an aha moment that doesn't matter what your background is as much as what your interests are and kind of how you think. That's fantastic. The, one of the most common misconceptions that a lot of people who are considering franchises have is, I've had this conversation quite too many times. I have a good friend. Um, he came to me, he said, hey, so you know, you do this franchise stuff. I said, yes, I do this franchise stuff. He says, look, you know, I've, I've always been interested in, um, in opening up my franchise. I said, okay, this is news to me, but okay. He says, um, I think I want to open an automotive franchise. You know, like a mighty key, you can do. I said, okay, why? That's my favorite question. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, you know, ever since I was a boy, I've loved tinkering with my father's cars. I like to get underneath the hood. Okay. So let me ask you a question. When you open a Jiffy Lube or a Maniki, as a business owner, are you the one going underneath the hoods of your customers' cars? <laughs> Brian sure as hell hopes so much. Because that's a loan that's <laughs> never going to be rich. Yeah. Right? What are you doing? You're hiring a team of people. So my question to my friend was, do you have a background in HR? Can you hire and can you fire? Can you manage the KPIs of the business? Because you're the business owner. You're not the tech. You are hiring techs to do that work. Big difference. So don't confuse any passions you have with the role that you will play as a business owner. Huge, huge mistake. So absolutely, absolutely. On the con side of the house, there are, not all, there are some franchises which will require you to have an annual sales goal that you have to meet in a certain, probably, mostly it's a year, right? In a 12 month year. A lot of people say, I don't want that. Okay, then we will not look at certain franchises and we will look at others. There are some people who say, yeah, this sounds good. I'd like to have a quicker ramp up. I'd like to have all of that stuff. But I don't want to pay the franchise fee. And I certainly don't want to pay the ongoing royalties. OK, so the question then becomes, what are you paying for? That money that you're giving back to the franchisor, what is it being used for? It's being used for this. So this is not me. These are stats that say, for any business you look at, so let's say a plumbing business, a plumbing franchise and a non-franchised plumbing business. Every single time, the franchised business will make more money faster than its non-franchised counterpart. That's a fact, that's a stat. That's What's that? It's because of big time is marketing. Huge <coughs> marketing. Right? You, you have an engine behind you. It's not you. Yes, Dennis. 
just I know you're just listing all these disadvantages, but let me tell you as a franchise, as a franchise team who owns their own franchise and stuff, as a colleague, let's see, let me go down this very fast from my experience. I don't see these disadvantages after the many years I've had my own franchise. I see these as 100% advantages, even though it's on the negative side. Following the playbook, following the playbook to be successful, you know what that prevents? Prevents me, prevents others from using their personal credit card to purchase someone else's travel. Because it says in there that you will not use your business credit card to purchase someone's travel. What does that do? It keeps me out of jail. Okay? <laughs> Annual sales goals and franchise fees will always be directly correlated. And I, I don't say always, but the more you make, the less you're paying fees. There's always those things. And yeah. if it progressively is less, that as far as you're paying those sales goals, it's usually lower the first year than it moves up. Protected territories, hey man, okay, again, that's that ramp up. You, you know you're going to, you bought it. You're going to get that business coming in that day if you're working hard. The binding contract, man, that's just a marriage. And I want a commitment from my spouse, and my spouse is that business. And the franchise problems is a practical example. The, uh, their, their, their IT system, their my mail system from the franchise went down. That was a problem, right? Imagine all my emails, your emails going away all at one time. Okay? But you know what, though? The advantage of a franchise is, is that they have over 1,100 franchisees out there, just what they did at 10 p.m. They got their people in that night and they had it up in four hours while everybody else on the East Coast was sleeping. If you own your own business, without that support team, it's your own. Well, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I just, I just had, these are all advantages. After the after the years I've been doing this, those, I, I know these, this is a great thing to have as a franchise. Boom, we're done with that slide. <laughs> By the way, I think there's a lot of money to be planned. Good job. Good job. We'll talk later. I love this watch. <laughs> so bad. So bad. Okay. As you guys can tell, I like to have fun. Um, my franchise. It has been one of the most successful industries in the last 50, 60, 65 years. Okay. These are all things that clients of mine have said to me when they first came to me. Biggest one. I think I'd like, at this point in my life, I'd like to take a little more control over my destiny. <coughs> this stuff is deep. When people come to me, they don't come to me just to buy a franchise. They're coming to, re to very intentionally redesign their lives. That is what they're doing. Right? These are just some of the reasons. <coughs> Why does it work? You'll hear me say during the course of the presentation, a franchise is nothing else it is all about its systems. So if you're looking at franchises, the first thing I will tell you is to say, look and see how robust the back-end systems are, because that's what you're paying for. That is what is going to help push you through in the first couple of years as you're running them. How robust are those systems? The biggest thing with the franchise is, do you guys know how easy it is to start a business? How many of you here have ever started a business? So I live in Virginia. Go to virginiastatecommission.com. Pay 100 bucks, Faisal Kamal LLC. How hard was that? So there's no heroism in starting a business. <coughs> Can you stay in business for the long haul? This is why franchising is so successful, right? These are the things you're getting. I tell my clients. If you cannot understand a particular business model from a franchisor, that is not a good business. If I have to explain at length, John, Rosa, oh, well, you know, you do this and then you do that and then you get the client and then, no. It cannot be that complicated. The best models out there are the simplest. Give you simplicity. You get that initial training. You will get ongoing support and education through your life as a franchisee. We go to annual conferences. We meet with our colleagues. We understand what's new, what's good and great in our industry. <coughs> what are the things to stay away from, right? It's an ongoing source and support system that we have. Name recognition is a funny one. It's a, it's a, it's a blade that cuts both ways, I think. Do you guys remember two, two and a half years ago, it happened over the summer. Suddenly we found out that the footlong south and subway was not a footlong? Oh my god. You remember that? What happened? The stock prices? It was horrible. It was horrible. Negative PR. 
Why? Because it's food that's going into our tummies. Okay? So it can cut both ways. There are many franchises that are very well known on the West Coast. They have not yet made their way to the East Coast. That is not a reason to not look at them. That's an opportunity. Right? There are many franchises that the franchisees are, pardon my very technical English, killing it. But you've never heard of them. It's a system. Okay? These are some of the reasons why. These are the five main categories in franchising. Does anybody know these are self-explanatory? So food, right? Fast food. What's the most <coughs> known example? McDonald's. Oh, McDonald's. The golden arches. Right? Food. Automotive. Mighty PGP do but a host of others. Retail. Businesses that require a retail location. Be anything. Does somebody know what business services is? What's business services? Like, uh, IT. Yes. You mentioned UPS store, mm -hmm. business services. You're a franchise that provides business services to other businesses and individuals in your community. Somebody give me an example of a home or personal services franchise. Carpet cleaning franchise. Home health care. Home health care. That industry has exploded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? When you think about the demographic shifts that are happening. Mm -hmm. Massage envy. See it everywhere. It's one of the biggest success stories in franchising. They opened up 3,500 3, locations in three years. Oh. Think about that. Are you familiar with Orange Theory Fitness? Yes. Mm -hmm. There's an association with the misogyny people, some nope. of them came over. No? No? Nope. Orange Theory. Yeah. Orange Theory is a boutique fitness concept. Out of Florida. They're based in Florida. Yeah. They are rapidly. almost entirely sold out over the, across the country. And but it's a franchise. It's a franchise. <coughs> Cycle Bar, Row House, D1, look them up. It's pretty insane. Right? Again, this is, when you start to think about franchises, I want you guys to start to think in terms of demographics. So the gentleman over there said in-home health care. Mm -hmm. Why? Aging population. Many of us don't want to send our parents into a facility. We want to keep them at home. That's one way to do it. Right? There's a lot of layoffs happening, right? We've all experienced that. One of the other industries that's exploded is temp staff. So you're a franchisee. You basically operate as an HR agency. You have a, you have a database of resumes. You have clients who are looking <coughs> to fill open positions. And you marry the two. Right? Demographic shifts. That are happening. Yeah, I'm, I'm just giving you an example. I, I, well, I work for my company, but I work for a company called Apex. And they're a billion dollar company, but it's just a, a recruiting company. Everybody's mm. staffing everywhere. Staffing everywhere. I, I think it's what's because of eliminating the insurance and all that. Everything is just, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Some so, the problem in today's marketplace is not that there aren't franchises. The problem is the exact opposite. The franchise is everywhere. Okay? So if you are looking, where do you even begin? Because all of these things, or some of these things, may be true. What does that mean? Not all may be available in your market. If you came to me and said, I want, I love, I've been dreaming about an orange theory. I want to be an owner. Well, you are SOL, my friend. <laughs> It is not available in any markets. There are many successful franchises we have in the DMV. I cannot show clients. I will not even bring it up because it's not available anymore. They're all sold out. Licensed. It may not be licensed to sell in our state. The gentleman over there who said, in home, these businesses require you to carry a special license as a franchisee. And you may find that the quota of licenses they have has been met. There are no more to be had. Right? And you spent all these many months looking at it, all for not. It may not be possible to operate in your state, back again to the license issue. Right? There may be many businesses out there that don't have a track record at all. These things, as 
somebody from the outside looking in, you would not know. <coughs> this is information that we have that we are updated on. Okay? Where we can say, well, John, I know your heart is set on this. There are no more licenses that the state of Virginia can give you as a business owner, unless you want to you know, move to Maryland or DC or okay? you wouldn't know. Nobody asked me about the cost. Are you all like sitting on five million dollars each and I'm only doubling the group? What's going on? Okay. Investment. If you are, I have lots of questions. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say something smart. <laughs> hey, hey. hey. I'm the banker. I love this guy. Okay. <laughs> Can anyone tell me to remember this? The categories? Remember the categories? What do you think this one is? Boom. Boom. Absolutely. What's your name, sir? David. David. That's right. Why? Why food? A front cost building, construction. Building, construction, real estate. This happens to be the second most expensive category in franchising. What's the first? Yes. What's the first? We see them everywhere, every corner on DC. Starbucks. No. No. Starbucks. No. Yes. <laughs> You can't say. <coughs> Neither can you. It's on every corner, you said? Almost. Every, every corner. Hotels. 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 Oh, hotels. Hotels. Yeah. Okay. Hotels. Yeah. Don't tell you to do that. You know that. OK. These are food. These are what are known as <coughs> retail businesses. Again, real estate. This, 100 to 250 are what are known as office-based businesses. They require a location, but are not as expensive as a retail location. Right? Think about it. Anytime you require a retail location, your investment goes up. And that last category, under 50,000, before you all get super excited about it, this is the category that's known as side businesses. So, you may be, you may be in a job that you love. Ooh, wonder of wonders, good for you. And, you have a little bit of money set aside that you want to invest in something, right? A side business, I'll give you an example. In every office building, um, you have vending machines. What do you think those are? That's a franchise. You can buy a couple of vending machines. Now, I never show clients these because in our part of the country, most people who come to me say, you know, I used to be at ABC company, and this was my income, and I'm trying to replicate a six-figure income. You will almost always never be able to do that with a, with a franchise in that investment range. Questions? Concerns? Let me ask you, like, yes. I, I thought about, I think there were about 10,000 of these. I thought about buying Redbox. I think it's the, the DVDs. I don't know the cost, but I thought about buying, uh, buying those for the same time. Why did you think about a red box? Um, because it's cheap. It, well, wrong. That's wrong. Well, I guess. Uh, well, I just made it's a pure profit. After after machines paid off, it should be pure profit. How many people actually go someplace to get DVDs to watch at home? Hands up. <laughs> Look around, John. Oh, ah, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm streaming and okay. Right. Do, do you see where I'm going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now. Right. Everything is digital there. Yeah. 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 Recession resistant businesses. These are businesses, no matter if the economy is going up or down, you are continuing to make money. These are just some examples. And a lot of them are available with the DMV. So like I guess I'm going to move too fast. If you have a job, if you're doing something that you love, but you still want to open a franchise, there's a category of franchises. This is passive, a little bit passive. Not completely, it's called semi absentee. These are examples. One of my most favorite examples is hair care. You can run five, six, seven hair salons spread out. Yes, yeah, somebody here said they were in beauty, that's why I pulled up that example. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> hair care, right? 
you can run multiples of these salons and you are maybe spending anywhere between three to five hours a month. Okay? You're talking like a hair cuttery, that kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. Super cuts, sports right. clips. Right. Yeah. These three things, you need to make sure that any franchise that you're looking at gives you these three. That's a starting point. This is the process that we use. It starts with you, if this is what you want to do. It starts with two assessments that you take. And then after we have that, we're going to sit down for an hour and a half, two hours. And I will ask you a thousand and one questions. I will know you better than your mother does. I'm being a little facetious, but not entirely. I like to get to know my clients. For lack of a better word, I get very intimate with my clients because this is a life-changing decision. And if you take it lightly, then I'm not the person that you are. That's what we do. After the consultation, we will sit down and we will create your business model. Not a business plan, your business model. Think of your business plan, business model as a canvas, a blank canvas. Together we sit down and we paint a picture of what your ideal business looks like. I have your assessments, I have your business model. We then move into what we call due diligence. This is when I introduce you to three. We work with three businesses at any point in time. I will introduce you to my franchisors. You will start to have calls with them. You will start to have calls with existing franchisees of those businesses. That's what we call due diligence or validation. You are validating with existing business owners what the franchisor told you was true. Are you really making this kind of money? Do they really provide you the kind of support that you're looking for? Yes, sir. Yeah, do you, do you get to choose the franchisees that you talk to or do does the franchisor? No. Okay, cool. because, because a lot of times they'll cherry pick. Absolutely, the, the, the absolutely. You, you know that they're giving you the top performers. Right. So here's what I tell my clients, great question. Talk to the top performers mm -hmm. once you've done that. You go back to the franchisor and you say, so I've done this. I'd like to start to talk with some of the other people in your system, people who are middle of the road. I also would very much like to talk to at least one franchisee who's struggling. Because you know, in every system, you're gonna get all of them. Mm -hmm. Right. For the for the due diligence, mm -hmm. um, uh, so one uh, business I wanted to talk to, cherry pick. It's not hard to see those who they are. Mm -hmm. And the other one just says, "Here's everybody." Mm -hmm. It gave me a list of one thousand franchisees, and it was like, "Here's our federal disclosure." I mean, that enclosure. Mm -hmm. it's like, here you go. Yeah, that's it's meant. It's, it's regular. Oh, they have to share that, right? But they. But you're like you said. But they. They can be. You know, people are what they are. But mm -hmm. I loved it. it. When you talk about qualifying, your due diligence of qualifying, it's, when I got that, well, I was like. There is no guesswork. Yeah. This is what is so beautiful about the process. You're not guessing. So remember I said the industry is regulated by the Trade Commission? Mm -hmm. One of the very first calls you will have with those franchises, they're legally required to give you a document called an FDD. Thank you for bringing that up. It's called the Franchise Disclosure Document. It's a legal document. If you can't sleep at night, <laughs> cuddle up with it. Yeah. Okay? But, joking aside, you need to go through that. Every FDD contains 23 items. There are a couple of items that are most relevant to clients. Item 19, earnings claims. Item 7, what is your all-in investment level? Right? You want to look at who the management of the company is. You want to see if the company has had any bankruptcies. Do they have any lawsuits outstanding? Right? Good information to have with a company that you're dropping a good bit of money on, right? Mm -hmm. I work one-on-one -on -one with clients. So I work with, with a handful of clients at any point in time because it's an intensive process. I work with clients anywhere between 45 to 60 days. A lot of people get a little scared. 60 days, I'll be done. I say, listen, if you're not bullshitting and you really want to find a business and you're doing the due diligence, 60 days is all you need. Really, it's all you need. You will be overwhelmed, you, you will feel you're being fed by a fire hose, but it's beautiful. You will walk away with education that you otherwise would have paid thousands of dollars for. It's a lovely process. And once, once we go through the process, in fact, as we're going through the process, I will bring Mr. Celebrant in. Because we want to find out sooner rather than later, what do your financials look like? Assets, liabilities, 
What is your financial reach? What can you afford without having to eat ramen noodles for six months? <laughs> we don't want that. I do not want you showing up at my door trying to kick my ass. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll do that. Brad, take it away, sir. Sure. And don't worry, I know nobody showed up today hoping to go to banking school, so I'll be very brief. <laughs> and I'm just gonna, I prepared a few buzzwords for a few different strategies that different aspiring or existing business owners use. If any of them sing to you, I just wanted to introduce the idea of a couple different avenues that folks in all different stages of life and wealth planning and career transition can consider based on whether you own a home, whether you've built up a 401k or a 403b from working at a school, in the government, everybody's different. If you don't own a home, but you have a lot of money in your savings account, then you would take a different avenue towards approaching this topic than somebody who is the opposite. Real estate intensive, doesn't hang on to much cash. So there's different ways to approach it, and I simply wanted to be here, listen to this conversation, and be a part of it just to introduce the idea that banking is one phase of considering buying in a franchise and real humans still operate in it. There are online lenders out there both for consumers and for businesses. I've never worked at one and I've worked only at two banks my whole career and they're both very old timey, handshake driven, the only guys wearing ties still. <laughs> and um, it is a very human interaction and not just looking at the numbers, <coughs> monkey could do that part. Um, we have spreadsheets <coughs> that basically tell us what the ratios are that matter for each individual loan if we're looking at a small business or a personal loan. I just wanted to introduce the idea that having a face-to-face -face or a phone call to start the conversation and consider if this is even a viable way for you to go, especially if you're still working in a job and thinking, is this the right moment for me to try something else, big or small, whether it's the half a million dollar investment or the side hustle gig. There are different ways to go about it and I like to think that I exist in a very narrow but important space along that journey. So again, just a couple of key words. There are different, as they say, credit vehicles. Oh yes, a quick question, Brian, on the previous slide, yeah. the 50,000 K number, what, what does that signify? That is a common barometer kind of entry point for not all, but many franchises, full-time franchises, if you want to just the specify. 50, sure, the 50K number comes in, if you remember the investment chart, the middle of the road was 150 to 250 investment level. $150,000 investment is a good approximation of a business that will give you that six-figure income replication. Now, when you buy that franchise, a third of the funds needs to come from you, your pocket. That's where the 50K comes in. Okay. This is liquid, this is not your button, it's liquid cash, right? Or stocks and bonds that you can easily liquidate. Mm -hmm. That's what that comes from. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks Great for question. asking, because not yeah, not a specific bank rule. There is there's I can't think of any example where I've worked on a loan, consumer or business side, where it was a magic exact number. You had to bring this much cash to the table, your credit score had to be exactly this number. It's all just a bunch of moving levers depending on the whole situation. Um, cash definitely plays a part because again, no matter what we're talking about, whether you own a business or not, you're not gonna find a bank except for the super wealthy. Certainly not me, I don't know about you guys. If you're not the super wealthy 1%, the bank's not gonna pay for 100% of your anything. That's a, that's a key thing. It's worth preaching just because it doesn't come up until folks have already gone through the motions and they really start falling in love with an idea sometimes. I'm saying just regular consumers like me who don't even own a business, they wanna buy a new car, they wanna buy a house, and then they start going through the motions, fill out a lot of paperwork. I hit them with more paperwork and then when we go over how much they have in savings, how much, not only they have in savings, but how much can they mentally and psychologically be prepared to part with to make this investment to show a lender that they're serious, because that matters. That skin in the game expression, it does matter. And again, there's no exact number, but just like most mortgage lenders, they're gonna wanna see 10, or 10 to 20% down payment. Same with buying a franchise, same with starting your own business, whatever it is. The more you ask the bank, the higher percentage of the total buy-in you ask the bank to lend, the less chance you have for success. All other things equal. 
And again, it, it rarely comes up up front, so that's part of my responsibility is to make sure that we cover it up front so that the right expectations are there because there's no reason taking up somebody's time if there isn't a viable end result. So again, just you can see a couple different ways that people can go about it. This is for folks who have built up a very strong personal credit background, have significant income and tremendous at and significant assets Personally, unsecured line of credit, you sign your name, guaranteeing that you'll pay back the loan. That's about it. It's the simplest, but it can be very hard to get. It's not a fit for everybody putting it up there. Not every bank offers it. Mine does, but again, it's not the most common thing. Home equity line of credit, I talk about quite a lot. My folks have one because I told them to. They, fortunately, they paid off their house because they downsized when my brother and I moved out a couple of years back. They lived very much within their means. They moved to a much smaller house, so they quickly paid off once they moved. They don't plan to move again, fortunately. They don't have, you know, if an emergency comes up and both cars break, they'll figure it out. They didn't need this, but I said, a home equity line, and that's, you know, forget the buying a business, just in general. Whoever's a homeowner here and has been in your house for more than a year or two, a home equity line has become a very popular thing because the cost to do it, to, to get in basically, the closing costs are minimal, to nil, depending where you go, there aren't the same closing costs as buying a house. And if you built up equity, usually the annual recurring fee is $100 or less. In my bank, it's $65 a year to keep this account open. Real quick, how home equity line works, if you've not heard of this before, think of it as a credit card with a higher limit, no plastic, and a lower interest rate. And the rate can vary. It can change over time as the market increases, just like mortgage rates, but it's something that you apply for once, as long as you can get approved and you've built some ownership in your house and paid down a mortgage if you had one, then it's something that will cost less than a credit card, can get you further than a credit card, and the interest rate, because the collateral is your house, because the collateral is your house, the bank is pretty confident that you're not gonna just go crazy on a shopping spree and forget to pay your bill, the interest rate is a lot lower than unsecured credit card. The downside or just the risk that you have to mitigate to decide if it's something that is appropriate for you, business venture or not, is you are signing, unlike an unsecured credit line, a home equity line of credit for a homeowner, you are signing a lien to the bank that they have a security interest in your home that if you run up a big bill, you borrow all the money from your home equity line and you were to go into default because you start a business, you did anything, you bought a second home, anything, and you could not pay back the bill, then the bank has an interest in your home. And again, it's just the pros and cons, so it's not something to be taken lightly, and that's why I get involved and we do a lot of talking before we get into anything, but that is one very common thing that folks can do if they have lived in a house for a while, if they either have been fortunate enough to pay off their mortgage or they've paid down their mortgage so that they are said to own a chunk of that house, you can leverage that to apply for a line of credit that just sits there until with a you know, maybe $100, $65 annual fee, and then you can draw off of that, kick it into your bank account if you want to invest in a franchise, start your own whatever. It's just a tool that is not advertised much, but I'm not sure why, because for the right situation, if it makes sense and people go about it the right way, I think it's super valuable. My folks are glad they did it because now Everything in the house broke all at once, they wouldn't have to scramble and figure out where do we get the money. They call a bank, shift over. It's something that they have and hopefully will never use. 401k retirement account. I'm not going to get into that. You have a financial advisor and accountant. There are more tax implications that are not to be taken lightly. Faisu and I both know different individuals who have bought into franchises, some pretty big ones as well. Um, where the bulk of their funding, they chose to go this way rather than approach the bank first, rather than go to friends and family, they borrowed off of their 401k because maybe they were one guy that worked in defense contracting, had a government pension that was paying him every month, and then he had a large 401k, and his policy allowed him to take a loan to himself off of that, and that exhausts my knowledge of how that works. <laughs> but it's something that if you have a large 401k, is a thing, but you guys talk about 401k rollovers. Yeah, that, that's what Brian's talking about. And we can help with that. So a lot of people sometimes think, oh, well, I'd love to, but I simply don't have the money. 
you may be mistaken. You might be sitting in a big 401k. <coughs> so you're using your retirement funds to fund your business. And you can do so without penalties and fees. Legally. Legally. Without a surprise tax bill. Yes, Did it work out OK for that guy? Did it have a happy ending? It's doing well. It's a franchise, my friend. What can I tell you? <laughs> He's doing well, he's profitable, and he yeah, didn't get hit by a surprise bill because I also know his accountant. He just planned it out. Didn't rush into anything. He's a sharp guy. And then SB alone, this is, I guess, what I do the most. Um, Small Business Administration, it's a government, it's a division of the government, agency of the government. The money for an SBA loan <coughs> does not come from the government, it comes from my employer. The banks and every SBA preferred lender. There are dozens of banks nationwide. I happen to work for one of them, but there are lots of banks that are very interested and motivated to lend to individual people like us who are either starting their own business or buying into a franchise. A franchise is a highly reputable, highly recognized way to get into business for somebody who has a professional resume that shows that they've been a leader, a manager, even if they're going into massage therapy and they're not a masseuse. The resume plus all the information that's publicly available in a franchise extends the conversation a lot faster than trying to pitch a banker like me your idea for some independent new business concept that doesn't mean that can't work. Every great company started somewhere, but it's a bigger uphill battle. <coughs> franchise, the whole business in a box thing, it gets the conversation moving really fast because there's all this research online that goes in but forward that you can point to and say, well, this is a concept that works. And um, so my job a lot of the time is to take an individual through the process of, quali of getting qualified for an SBA loan. We look at your personal credit score. Don't ask me to explain exactly why your score is what it is, because there are a lot of different levers there too. I can help coach through and advise on what could influence your score more than others, but it's a definitely a moving target. Doesn't always seem fair, but being in the know about your credit score due to all the crazy stuff in the news the past couple of years with identity threats <coughs> and things like that. There are many free ways to stay on top of your credit and if everybody in this room isn't checking that at least monthly, I encourage you to do so because again, it doesn't have to cost you anything. The bank cares about your credit score. We care about how much of your own money, whether it's in a 401k or just in your bank account, how much money you're willing and able responsibly to invest in your own company because again the more that you ask the bank to cover out of the 100% pie the tougher conversation it is. All other things equal if you come in and say the franchise fee to get involved or to, to buy in $200,000 according to Fizun, I have this much in my bank account I am totally comfortable putting half that bill. I have $100,000 I can put into this. Could I get an SBA loan for half? That's a lot easier conversation and just more likely to work out than if you come and say, I have this great idea, I love this franchise, I'll put 5,000 in, you guys pay the other 195. Not a good way to start the relationship. And again, getting back to the SBA money, again, comes from the bank, and the SBA accredited bank, like City National does it. The money comes from us, the SBA program is simply a back-end guarantee. I think but almost like it's not an insurance policy, but it's basically insurance for the bank to give us confidence to lend to more potential business owners. And the guarantee means that if you, if the borrower were to default, because the business for whatever reason just didn't go as they anticipated, the government agency, the SBA, will cover a portion, not 100%, but a portion, sometimes up to more than 50% of the original loan, so the bank's loss would be mitigated. Obviously, that's a worst case scenario, but my world is managing and trying to anticipate risk. And the SBA loan programs, there are a bunch of different kinds. You can go on sba.gov and drive yourself absolutely mad. There are a lot of different programs out there depending on what you're trying to do and what your background is. And um, banks are one institution that can help make sense of it. But again, it's not for the faint of heart. It's by no means easy, but I wanted to be here to take you through and just say there, there are options out there. There are a ton of resources that are motivated to see regular Joes like us become business owners if truly that is what you want to do and you are willing to pay a little bit of your own money to see it happen. That's all I got.
before you do anything, talk with her a lot, talk to your accountant a lot. I'm in the business of building relationships, making introductions. When I'm not working on a loan or opening an account for somebody, I'm collecting resources in the DC area that can give good advice on things I'm not subject matter expert in. If any of you are thinking about making a move like this and you don't have a friend that's an accountant or a financial advisor, we know a bunch. And I love making those introductions because it's not something you want to do alone. Fantastic. I think that's all we got for you, folks. There's an evaluation form. You'll take a look at it at the bottom of the page. There are a number of things that we do. If you'd like to speak in a little more detail, happy to jump on a call with you, uh, talk through any questions, specific questions that you guys might have. If you just want to connect with me, uh, that's lovely. I'm on LinkedIn. You will find me easily because there apparently is only one Faisal Kamal on the LinkedIn platform. I wonder why it's such a common name. Um, exactly. Um, we have a number of webinars that we offer every month. Um, there's always something happening. If franchising is something that is truly of interest to you, I would say the first step is to get an education. Try and start to learn about the different business models out there. This is not something you want to go in into lightly. You know, as Brian said many, many times. Uh, and a good place to start is education. So fill out the, the, the evaluation form, please. Give me the good, bad, and ugly. I really do pay attention to the form. I tweak my next seminar here and other places where I where I speak um, so that it's, it's much more helpful to the audience that I'm giving it to. I know we rushed through a lot of information. I jumped over a lot of slides. If any of you would like that, uh, just put that note in there. I'm happy to send it over to you. And uh, once you fill out the evaluation form, Mr. Ken is going to do a drawing for a copy of this book. The Franchise MBA is the best-selling book on franchises on Amazon. And the gentleman who wrote the book is my partner, Nikki Amakis. It's a great primer if you're starting the process, and just a good place to begin. So fill out the form, please. Thank you. President Brian, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. So we have a little memento of your time here with us at 40 plus. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank so you, good sir. to see you both. Thanks. All right. Great to be here. And uh, folks, please enjoy network, continue to network. We still have some snacks in the back. Thank you all for coming. As I mentioned, uh, we're here every Monday morning at 10 o'clock, and then once a month in the evening. Next month's program I think dovetails very well with, with what we've been talking about tonight. Um, Again, yeah, network, network, network. Uh, we all know that's generally how we're going to learn about our next professional opportunity at our stage in career. So thank you all for coming. Have a good evening. Stay warm, stay dry.